Rosalind Miles does not like to identify herself by her academic credentials, nor does she like to say, I am a person in this job at that institution. For Rosalind, it's her passion for health, sports, recreation, fitness, and activity that define her role. That said, Rosalind is the founder and executive director of the Indigenous Physical Activity and Cultural Circle. For the past 32 years, Dr. Miles has been working in the sports, fitness, education, and health field in a variety of disciplines. As a Division I level NCAA level coach, a registered kinesiologist, an active release therapist, a college and university instructor, a researcher, a nationally awarded certified strength and conditioning specialist, and is a national level athlete. In this episode of Careers That Matter, Dr. Rosalind Miles takes us inside her career, a career that is making a significant difference in the lives of thousands of people. How do we describe what your profession is? Like, what's your job right now? Well, that's one thing that's really important being First Nations, is that you don't really identify with your job. Ah. You identify with your passion. So I had to be very clear. I work at the University of British Columbia, and I'm a research associate. And however, I had to be clear with our director is that Rosalind Miles isn't a research associate. I don't walk into Moscow and go, well, I'm the research associate for UBC, and therefore help me put on this 5K run. No, I've been working my relationship with them for more than 20 years. Mm -hmm. They know me. They, they've never known my job titles. They just know Rosalind. She likes to promote sports, physical activity. So no matter where I am, whatever job I do, I'm always about promoting being physically active. Whether I'm working for First Nations Health Authority, which I've done, whether I'm with my nonprofit, you know, Indigenous Physical Activity and Cultural Circle, which is the longest name, <laughs> <laughs> or UBC, I'm always promoting sports, recreation, fitness, and being traditionally active, period. That's to who everyone. I am. To everyone, wherever I am, whatever mm -hmm. I do. And I've come from a holistic health and wellness perspective, you know, and, and that has grown in my older age, you know, so it, it's, and it's something that fits more with being uh, family centered now, with having a daughter and, and being married. And I think um, it, it grew off a background. And that's one thing I really love. Um, when I was young, I tried to plan everything, I tried to control my life and think about what am I gonna be when I grew up, you know? And, and I just followed doors that opened that felt healthy and happy, you know? And it helped and they added to my life. They help satisfy my, I call it my conditions of satisfaction, where <laughs> I drive to work, I can be casual or I can be dressed up or I can, you know, so I have a lot of um, freedoms that don't take away from the other parts of my life, but it continues with my passion. Um, when I was younger, um, I was really competitive and I was a uh, strength and conditioning coach and I used to be the provincial director for the NSCA, the National Strength and Conditioning Association. Mm -hmm. And I was really a hardcore uh, coach. You know, I worked at UBC, and then I went. Like. Oh, a dictator. <laughs> yeah. Like, very. Yeah. Like, and I loved it. It was so much fun. And and this, and this my athletes really loved I, I think they liked to work with me because I was predictable. I always had rules. I, was, I never bent my rules. And um, it was something in my... my my vision statement back in the day was, I empower athletes to be champions. You were what? Oh, no. My vision statement mm. was, um, I empower athletes to be champions. Mm, okay. So that was my role. And it was whether, it, and it wasn't just about physical, like I had the science behind it, because I went to university forever, <laughs> but I also had um, the passion behind it. And I never apologized for being a woman, because I felt that brought an, another gift to the table. Um, because I was very nurturing, you know, with my athletes. And the coaches were always shocked that the athletes worked so well with me. And I, and I thought about it. It's because a lot of kids nowadays grow, grow up with a, a household that's led by women or they're single-parent homes. And so the athletes had no problem with me being on the field with them. Um, I coached football. I was the second-ever female football coach in Florida. I did special teams as well at a high school. How did you wind up there? Well, I wanted to be in the NFL, and I had interviews with Miami Dolphins and the 49ers. I was the first woman they left, led into the NFL Combines. Um, I, was I don't know what the NFL Combines are. What are they? It's in Indianapolis, and it's where um, 
players who are going to go into the draft for the NFL go and try out in front of all the head NFL football coaches. So you and went and tried out? No, I was one of the um, the, the mm. athletes' trainers. Okay. So I was allowed to go in. I got signed permission from uh, a call. The college strength and conditioning coaches can go in with the athlete. So I was there with Michael Collins. He was from Wake Forest University. And I went in there on behalf of University of Central Florida, who I worked for. And I went in with him to help encourage him for to, to move him up the draft. Ah, okay, okay, got it. And so typically, yeah. it's not a place for women because the men get stripped down and they you know do their measure their weight and height, and it's usually it's all males, it's all men, and it's very intimidating because it's all the head NFL football coaches, and. Um, there's so many stories into that, but I'm just going to leave that at that. It's, I, I it's, know nothing of that world. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I really don't. <laughs> it's, it's, you have to be consistent. You have to have integrity. You have to practice what you preach, and you have to be very strong, and you cannot be emotional. You can be um, uh, passionate about what you're giving to the, to the team, and you also, you also have to make sure when you have a program, if your athlete has a soft tissue injury that's not due to impact, it's your fault. So you want to have a program that makes your athletes be fast, strong, flexible, all the things for them to excel you know, within the season mm -hmm. um, that picks them up at the right time. And you also want to make sure that they never get an injury because the injury means you have muscle imbalances. So I studied that for 22 years wow. in university, and I paid for my education by coaching so I only went, I took three courses a semester. So what was your discipline that you studied? So I did my, um, I did a phys ed diploma at Langara. Yes. An undergrad at Trinity Western, BA, uh, physical education. I did my master's in human kinetics at UBC. And then I um, went to UCF and did my education doctoral degree. UCF? Yeah. University of Florida? Yeah, yeah, University of Central Florida. Okay. And I uh, did curriculum instruction specializing in exercise science. So I was in school for a long time. You were in school for a long time, and that's what put you on the football field. Ultimately. Yeah, and yes. I had to pay for my own school. So I, I, um, I asked for band support at the beginning, but it, my grades were horrific. Um, I had to learn how to learn in university. So I hate <laughs> reading. So your grades were horrific, but that didn't stand in your way. <laughs> no, I, I just had really great support. You know, and I think that's one thing that's really needed for Indigenous youth. I had some people who actually really believed in me. Like friends, oh, wow. It's amazing parents. how important that is. Yeah, people yeah. who really, like, I worked at Trinity Western, they said, well, why don't you work part-time at the weight room, and same thing at Langara. And I had people who really were good people who helped open doors for me. Mm -hmm. And I think it's because I worked really hard. I might not have been efficient, and I, and I wasn't the smartest. Um, but I, but you sure were passionate. Yeah. So what role does passion play in... It's everything. Yeah? It's, it's, it's for motivation around your intrinsic motivation is the most important thing. It's not about getting a car or an award or like, you know, all those things are important or getting a t-shirt for doing a run. It's about how you feel when you achieve something. Mm -hmm. So I think that um, knowing that I could actually stay in university and, and I was chipping away at it, I'm like, oh, wow, I might get a degree. <laughs> it, took yeah. me, it took me nine years. And I just kind of knowing that um, there was an outcome for it, you know, yeah. in the sense that that I'm actually smart, even though it might show in my it might not show in my grades. I actually I'm learning, um, so I had to read all my textbooks into a tape recorder back in the day when they had tape recorders, and um, and I would put in a Sony Walkman and I'd go for a walk and listen to myself read my textbooks because I couldn't sit still. And what a fantastic way to learn. And I, I find that I do that as w in a way even now. Yeah. Like when I need to prepare for a conversation and whatnot, I will say it out loud. I'll talk to somebody else. I'll say, look, I've got to do this conversation. Yeah. And, and that process really helps to consolidate that information and make it understandable. Because yeah. I know that I'm now communicating it in some way that is comprehensible. I, I don't get the whole sitting still looking at something. So if you told me yeah. I had to read a book, it'd be like saying, Rosalind, stare at this cup for two hours and don't move. That's what reading is to me. Mm -hmm. I hate it. And so I had to learn how, because you have to read. I had to learn how to, 
do well, it. Well, as you said, you had to learn how to learn for you. Yeah. It, it's an individual process. Yeah. And so that was, that was really, and, uh, and I started teaching courses where I knew there'd be films on, like on um, Greek literature. You got the Iliad and Ulysses. They always have all those in films and plays. Uh, children's literature, they always have the children's book yeah. on videos and films. So I'd go to the library and I'd rent the films. And then it would kind of supplement the reading, yeah. and um, and I also learned that I can you can never miss a class. So if yeah. you want an A, you can never miss a class. And I graduated with international honors um, from Phi Lambda Theta Society. Uh, you know, I, and um, I, if I didn't get an A, you know, I was sh in shock in my my last nine years <laughs> of university. Um, but it, it just was hard work, and and. I, I was a horrible waitress, you know, I, when I, after high school, and I knew I had to go to university, you know, and, and I... To, to it, do something else. To do something else. <laughs> and so, look at where uh, it has all wound up. Yeah. So what does a typical day look like for you now? Wow, I drop mm -hmm. off my daughter yeah. at school, and then I, I go to UBC, and we have a, a research lab with some amazing students and uh, from university and from UBC. And they're all in the Human Connects program, and, and some of them are trying to get into med school. And so um, we have a research grant from the Canadian Institute of Health Research where we promote being physically active for Indigenous communities. And so first thing we do is um, we do a lot of sharing circles. Um, that's our way of transfer of knowledge, and we, we record or take notes on those circles or videotape. Um, and we ask people, what does health and wellness mean to you? And, uh, and we create programs for people to do, like we did train the trainer, a fitness program in our, my, my community, 13 weeks, where we gave away Fitbits and uh, we had, um, we sat every week, we had a new topic and we talked about what does fitness, you know, physical activity mean for the community. And we built on the strengths that were there already. So, um, so you're going out into communities. Yeah. Uh, you're not active. you're not having students come into the classroom. Rather, you're going out into communities with a program and with UBC students. Mm, with UBC students as well, because yeah. they're learning in the process. Yeah, and it's been oh, amazing, okay. and, and it almost making me cry. But it was like, I'll never forget. Um, last summer, um, we had two students, um, and uh, I don't think they'll. Mind, well, I shouldn't say their names, but they were um, they were out with me in Lytton. Mm -hmm. And we have an old, the old site of St. George's Residential School. And I said, you know, these, some, there were some of our participants who went to that school. And uh, they were in shock. They just said, we, we had no idea. Of course but, not, because and we've hidden that, that from general That we had residential ed, ed. school here and the traumas and yeah. that they're real. And they actually met the people who went to these schools. And they're younger than me. They're not people... When you see the Truth and Reconciliation, it's all these black and whites, and they have these old nuns sitting over these students with all their hair cut off and all the... Right, as though they we're 140 like, years ago, I know. You know, yeah. and, and the, the biggest thing you always hear from people, they always say, oh, why don't they get over it? You know, and I'm just <laughs> like, wow, like if you were raped, would you get over it? How would you feel if someone said that to you? These are people who are alive. They're alive human yeah. beings. And um, the trauma didn't happen just once. It happened for years. You know, for years you were traumatized, you know, and you never got to go home to see your parents, right. you know, and, and so you just have to love these people. You know? uh, I know that Senator Sinclair, when he was opening the, uh, one of the sessions for the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, yeah. uh, quoted somebody whose name I do not have off the top of my head, okay. but um, the quote was, you may think you're done with the past, yeah, but the past is not done with you. Yeah, and that's that's the hardest thing about the truth and reconciliation part is the truth part. Yeah. And the truth part is really hard for us survivors. So I didn't go to residential school, but I know my father's reality, and that's it breaks right. my heart. You know. Well, and and that is part of your journey as well. Yeah, and and you have to come from a place of, um, is it healthy to have all that? You know, I mean, and so you think about that. I thought I'm lucky that my father never talked to me about his past, mm -hmm. his traumas. I didn't carry that on my shoulders. Yeah. I was informed when I was a lot older, when I was 30. My aunt sat, sat me down and told me what happened in the school. And I was just mortified. And, but I was at the age where I could handle it. And I was at the age where I already loved my dad unconditionally. And... But I think about how, oh, let's just all talk about it, the truth, the truth, the truth. And the residual trauma for the people who hear it, whether you're Indigenous or not, is hard. 
and you can't yeah. erase some things. So we have to talk about the truth still. Well, you know? because if we don't, then we can't uh, respond appropriately. And what what matters now is how we choose to respond and where do we go from here. And also, we have all those people who shared their stories. And, and were they did they receive counseling? Did they receive support? You know? Hmm. So those are the things that I concern. So we have all this truth, truth, truth. Well, you share the story once, then you should be healed. You know? I don't think my father would have ever healed. You know? And that was never a condition I put on him. You know, I never put, oh, well, I'll love you when you're healed. You don't do that to people. Right. You love them where they're at, and you set boundaries if you need to. Yeah. You know, um, however, um, so you, when you're, you know, my father, I, I always laugh. Mm. I always think about this when, when he was in school and how he was treated. And I thought, I wish he could go back to those priests and those nuns and say, you know what? My daughter has her doctorate. My son is a lawyer. And my other son has a successful business. You know, he's an entrepreneur. They're all, they're not, they're not what you said we were, you know? So, because there's <laughs> careers that matter, and somebody looks yeah. at you and goes, well, hang on a second, I'm not going to have that experience to, yeah. to wind up being in a position where I can help to influence change the way that you are. If you're talking to somebody who's younger right now who goes, oh, wow. but I want to be like you, what are a couple of things that they need to keep in mind that will help them have the cultural understanding, yeah. sensitivity, and yet the drive and, and determination that you have to encourage other people to a better yeah. life? It's real hard work. Yeah. It's extremely hard. But I look back at I worked eight hours a week as a coach and I went to school full time, you know, three courses. I thought, how did I do that? I look back at it, but I was young, you know. <laughs> However, but also it was hard work. I had to be very disciplined. I didn't own a TV mm -hmm. until two thousand and five. I I didn't I only Friday night was my only night I gave myself a break. You know, whether it was watching a movie mm -hmm. or whether it was going out with friends, that was usually my only night. On Sunday morning when I woke up, I did homework until it was all done to start the week. Monday to Thursday, I did homework two to three hours a day. That was just for three courses, you know? And, and so I had to, and I wasn't able to relax until I knew that all my work was done, you know? And, but I was physically active every single day. Every single day I used to go for a run like 10K, now I just go for walks. Um, I was hyperactive. And being a coach, I was able to train at my work as well, and it was free. Um, my budget for groceries was $26 a week, you know, and as long as I had one protein source a day, like, you know, tuna, a can of tuna or a can of sardines, boiled eggs, um, I had to have a strong budget because I had to pay for things, but I also invested in myself. You know, I, I bought myself new clothes and, and I also made sure I always had friends with me that I could socialize with on Fridays, you know, and um, so university isn't a place to party, you know, it's a place to, you know, um, go through the grinds and you're not going to always like your teachers, but you have to, you have to, it's a system, you know? Well, and you're it's establishing the groundwork that will yeah. be the foundation of the rest of your life. And the, the mm. more you go up, when you get to your master's, you can actually start forming what you want to be and what you want to do. So your right. master's is way easier than your undergrad. Not, I shouldn't say easy, it's still a lot of work, but you don't have the exams anymore. You have more like papers and reflection pieces. Okay, now, now let's just end. Don't have somebody go, oh my gosh, that's way too much. You've got to say, it's worth it. <laughs> it is worth it. You know, um, a year after I finished, I paid off all my student loans. You know, I paid everything off and I had my PhD and you know what? I, I hate to say that I got a little lazy with my writing. I still am. Because I thought, oh, well, I have my doctorate. You know, I, I, no one can tell me I'm stupid. No one can tell me I didn't work hard. No one can ever say that to me, you know? And so it's, it's a lot of pride and um, going to university isn't for everybody, but for myself, it was, it was where I could go and create, uh, you know, balance my life with my family with, um, my, and give back to my community in a way that's meaningful. So I'm wow. always advocating for Lytton and Musqueam because that's where I live. And um, I just think that Life is too short, and you got to work hard, but you have to have that balance. And my grandmother taught me reciprocity, which means you always give back. And and the main reason I give back is it makes me feel good, you know. So when I'm when I'm complaining about my life, I I think, well, you know, I need to get more refocused and have gratitude for what I have and give. And it's not giving money; it's giving time, you know. It's really giving time, and that's what our young people really need. They need to have people there for them, you know, help them open the doors for them, you know?
and I, I'm lucky to do that at UBC. It's and a lot of fun. And you are a great example of a life well lived. Oh, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much for sharing that. Yeah, no problem.